Welcome to the realm of relativity. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on Einstein's theories of special and general relativity, but before we do, a quick PSA. The topic of relativity, both in the special and general cases, can be incredibly counterintuitive and completely incomprehensible to someone who's just being introduced to it. So if it doesn't make sense to you immediately, do not be alarmed or discouraged. You're not alone. It will take some time for it to start to fall into place. Now, the term relativity encompasses so much information nowadays, but we'll be focusing on the branches of special and general relativity specifically. So let's rewind to the beginning and see where this all started. Meet Albert Einstein, the man responsible for the upheaval of our understanding of the universe and the concepts associated with modern physics at the turn of the 20th century. It was through his various experiments and publications that we now have the concept of relativity governing our understanding of not only our place in the universe, but how everything in the universe interacts with each other. But the interesting thing about how the topic of relativity came about is that it didn't come as a result of laboratory experiments like the ones we normally see in the various science lab classes that are offered in high school or college or university, but rather, relativity was the result of thinking. Einstein conducted what he called Gedanken experiments, which literally translates from German to English as thought experiments, in which the person proposing a possible hypothesis must think through the various consequential scenarios that emerge from the initial concept being hypothesized. But of course, he was much younger than this when he first published his original report on special relativity. It all started at the dawn of the 20th century, when Einstein was just 22 years old and recently hired as a patent office clerk in Bern. During his time there, when he wasn't even considered really a revolutionary scientist yet, but rather just a regular old guy working at a patent office, he came up with his various thought experiments that helped him see motions differently. He described that your experience of motion and time is unique to you. It's relative to the experiencer. Specifically, he said that motion affects our measurements of not only time, but distance and mass as well. This concept was the basis of his theory of special relativity. All that by just thinking about it. And now it's accepted worldwide as fact. Some of the major implications of motion affecting our measurements of time, distance, and mass is that a person's concept of their own physical reality doesn't change, regardless of how fast you are moving as long as the motion is constant motion. So for someone sitting down in a windowless room, their understanding of their physical reality will be the same whether they are on the surface of the Earth or accelerating upwards through space at the same rate that gravity would cause you to accelerate downwards towards the Earth. The other implication is that the speed of light in a vacuum is always the same, regardless of your own motion. In fact, Einstein's theories were and still are measurable. They are supported by evidence. One of the first measurable experiments that was later used to verify special relativity was the Michelson-Morley experiment, originally conducted between April and July of 1887 by physicists Albert A. Michelson of the Case School of Applied Science, later the Case Institute of Technology, and Edward Morley of Western Reserve University. The two institutions eventually merged to form the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, which still operates today as a powerhouse for medical and technological research. In the basement of the John D. Rockefeller Physics Building at Western University's Cleveland campus, they were attempting to detect the presence of the luminiferous ether, the theorized medium through which light propagates. They expected their experiment to be foolproof. Their experimental design was foolproof. They anticipated that when a laser beam would come into contact with a partially transparent mirror, which would split the beam of light and send one beam through to a fixed mirror on the other side and the other beam to a movable mirror that was perpendicular to the original beam, the reflected beams of light would return and pass through the mirror and appear on a screen, creating an interference pattern, as light waves were expected to do. However, their expectation was that these reflected beams would be out of sync, and one would arrive a brief moment after the first, because the waves of light were expected to be moving through the luminiferous ether, causing their expected delay. But what Michelson and Morley failed to account for in their experimental design was that there was no luminiferous ether for them to detect in the first place. But they didn't know that yet. Their observations, however, showed that the speed of light is always 
without fail, going to be unaffected by any other motion, which turned out to be one of the ideas theorized and thus supported in Einstein's theory of special relativity. Another example that further solidified Einstein's theory of special relativity was the apparent shift in the positions of stars in a star cluster directly behind the sun during the daytime that was observed during the total solar eclipse of 1929. Where the stars were expected to appear is not where they actually appeared, and that was due to the fact that the light traveling from those stars began to divert its path when it passed by the sun. But more on that later. Now, the three main implications of special relativity that we'll focus on are length contraction, time dilation, and the relativistic illusion of mass increase. But first, let's talk about length contraction. We know how to measure the length of an object. You stick a ruler up next to the thing and measure the distance between the two endpoints of the thing. But that's assuming that the two ends of the object are in a stationary reference frame, meaning that neither of the two ends are really experiencing any difference in their motion. This length, measured when the full length of the object is completely in the stationary reference frame, is called the proper length of the object. But if it were moving at an extremely high velocity, say 99% of the speed of light, it would be impossible for both ends of the object to experience the same type of motion. So its perceived length, from our point of view, will appear shorter. For example, Imagine you're standing at the loading dock of a train station waiting for your train to arrive. When it does, it stops and is completely at rest waiting for you to step on. Now let's say an incredibly fast train comes through the train station and it doesn't stop. It just plows right through. If it moves at relativistic speeds like 30% the speed of light, its apparent length will seem shorter to you now from your point of view. And if the speeds were to be any higher, the length would appear shorter and shorter. So special relativity states that the faster an object moves, the more its length will appear to contract. The thing is though that this concept of length contraction is also applicable the other way around. To the passengers on the train, you and your friends standing on the platform would look like this while both the train and its passengers, and you, are not moving. But as the train picks up speed and passes by other groups of people on later platforms if it doesn't stop on the way through, those groups will look like this. The length of these crowds will appear to have contracted. Now the next implication of special relativity that we'll look at is the concept of time dilation. This concept states that as the clock itself moves faster, say if it were on a relativistic jet moving very fast, the passage of time on that jet will be recorded more slowly than another clock that sits at rest on the surface of the Earth. The moving clock measures less time elapsed in the same period of time that is recorded on the Earth clock. If you happen to be counting the number of hours passed on Earth for every hour recorded on the fast-moving clock, you'll see that in this animation, five hours have passed on Earth for every hour elapsed on the moving clock. The concept of time dilation also explains the mysterious phenomenon of more muons surviving their descent from outer space onto detectors on the surface of the Earth than expected. A muon is an unstable subatomic particle that is created indirectly as a decay product of collisions of cosmic rays with particles in Earth's atmosphere. One of the later videos in this series will explain the details of how muon decay validates the concept of time dilation. So, bottom line, time is weird. But if you were to ask Einstein, who allegedly has been quoted to say that when you are courting a nice girl, an hour seems like a second. When you sit on a red-hot cinder, a second seems like an hour. That's relativity. So it may actually be better to say that time is relative to the experiencer. Now the last implication of special relativity that we'll discuss in this video is the relativistic illusion of mass increase. Now keep in mind, the concept of an object's mass is that its mass never changes. Whether you're a pebble on the beach or a pebble in the vacuum of space, your mass is your mass and that's that. It will not change. So why do we have this concept of relativistic mass or the illusion that mass increases in the confines of special relativity? The concept of mass increase can be explained with the following approach. When you have an object moving with some velocity, like 5 meters per second or some similar regular velocity, the object will carry some energy. The amount of energy it carries depends on the mass, but more importantly, on the velocity. 
the higher the velocity, the higher the energy. So what happens if the velocity is in the realm of relativity, for example? If the object's velocity is, say, 80% of the speed of light, I mean, it's up there in terms of its speed, its energy is dominated by another equation entirely. E equals mc squared the all-too-familiar equation that more or less broke all possible laws of physics when it was first introduced in 1905. Now, yes, this is the same equation that we used in determining how much energy was produced in the fusion of hydrogen into helium in the core of the sun, but it can also be used to further support relativistic mass and the illusion that it must increase at relativistic speeds. So if the object is moving at a relativistic speed close to the speed of light, that object has an increased amount of energy. Now, the only way that this equation will remain balanced is if the mass were to increase, since the speed of light is a constant, but it's an illusion. And that's the main thing to remember here. The more precise relativistic energy equation is actually referred to as the energy-momentum relation, and it looks like this. But we won't be dwelling on it too much in this class. You can look into it if you want, but for all intents and purposes of this class, we'll be moving on to general relativity.